Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Understanding Construction Drawings. Today, in Lesson 8, we're going to be taking a look at a set of drawings and we're going to be looking at floor framing and wall framing and how that goes together. In my previous video, I discussed the different components that are involved in framing. So if you like, check out my playlist, click subscribe, look on the YouTube channel. You can go back to previous videos. Also look in the description and you'll see links to other videos as well. You might have to copy and paste them in, but they should work for you. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, this is a set of production drawings uh, for a subdivision that had multiple homes being built. And in this particular case, they're being built in just outside Toronto, Canada. Uh, these drawings, unlike some of the other ones that I've used, are all imperial. So you'll get a good sense of uh, imperial measurement on this particular set. Uh, because it's a large subdivision, they have uh, different elevations for the front of the houses. What that means is you have more or less the same floor plan but on different streets or different uh, areas, they might go with a different front view for the house. So once you go inside the house, pretty much everything is the same, but on the outside, it looks somewhat uh, different, which is nice because then the neighborhood looks like it's all much more custom to homes. It gives a different kind of flavor. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, and even still today in some jurisdictions, uh, they let the builder do whatever they want, and then you kind of get cookie cutter houses where they all look the same. So in this particular case, they've made a conscious effort, the municipality, to make sure that there's a good distribution of different looks on the house. A lot of progressive builders would have done that anyways uh, because they know homeowners like uh, some variety and they don't want that cookie cutter um, sort of look, but a lot of townships will make sure that that doesn't happen. Not all, it uh, just depends where you live. And so it gives you a little bit of a sense that way. All right, so this is, I'm going to go to a larger view, so I'll zoom in in a minute, but just showing you two pages at once. So usually there's the cover area. We've talked about title blocks in previous uh, videos. Uh, this is 3 sixteenths to a foot. That's basically the scale that's used. So that means 3 sixteenths of an inch on the paper represents one foot in real life. And we have the construction notes, which, you know, they're usually found on the front pages of a drawing or at the end of the set of drawings. There's no sort of drawing police for that, but they're usually one or the other. I, I typically like when they're right at the front. And this is all the information that gives you a lot of details that you're not going to find on the drawings, nor do you want to find that on the drawings. You want to have it somewhere that you can easily find it without it crowding up the drawings that you can't actually read the drawings. And of course, we have in this particular case our foundation or basement floor plan and we can see a bunch of different things we've also talked about line types in the previous drawings these are all object lines representing the foundation wall these are hidden lines representing the footing that's going around the foundation wall in this particular set of drawings you have a choice you have just going to the title block here lower level plan or basement elevation a and then optional finished lower level plan elevation a and so you have a choice if you wanted to have your basement finished when you purchased it or not. And so that's just another element of this particular set of drawings. And we've talked about foundations again in previous uh, lessons. Uh, so we can see here we've got the first floor and this is saying main level plan elevation A, right? So main uh, level plan elevation A and on the right here we've got second level plan elevation a so maybe i'm just going to go so that you can see it a little bit bigger on one sheet of paper here so just give me a second okay so i'm in single page view right now and we've just gone from the foundation uh, drawing this one is the actual finished choice if you want to have a finished basement plan and so it's that's why it's got you see insulation hatched and so these would be framed out walls here it's showing a bathroom down in here then there's a section that's unfinished so going to the actual first floor they have what they call a great room a breakfast area a kitchen uh, a dining room and what i've told you in previous drawings is what i usually do is I usually pretend like I'm walking through the front door and I'm looking around and what do I see? And so in this particular case, 
If you look to the left, when you come through the front door, it says 42 inch half high half wall. So there's going to be an opening, but there's going to be a little bit of a wall here and it's going to be 42 inches off the floor. And the reason that's there, you could put a sofa or something against that wall. Uh, so you wouldn't see the back of it. It makes it a nice place to position it. Maybe the TV can go over on this side if that's what you want, but it makes it usable space. But at the same time, it doesn't make it seem like a closed in room. It seems much more open. You do have this column here that would be there. And then you have basically this area here with the dashed line. And you can see that it says FA at eight foot AFF right and that's uh, referring to a flat arch at eight feet above finished floor so you get to use used to what these abbreviations are now if I was new to these drawings what I would probably want to do is spend a little bit of time going back up to the beginning here and looking at the legend and you'll probably find a lot of these things here like flat arch right above finished floor so a number of the abbreviations and symbols uh, that we'll be talking about as I always say take a good look at the legend things like point load that's a concentrated load that's coming down probably supporting a beam from up above uh, you'll find there and then you get used to it right and you'll also see information here we talked in the previous session about lintels you know if you're uh, if you're used to construction sites typically we'll call it a header if you're from the US or some other countries they tend to call it a header uh, we tend to call it a header here too in Canada to be honest on our uh, construction sites but our building code refers to it as a lintel. So, you know, if you really want to uh, let a building inspector know that you know what you're talking about, if you call it a lintel, if you're in Canada, uh, that would tend to uh, work fairly well because if you look up header, that's only found in an opening for a floor. So a lintel is a beam that goes over a window or door um, typically, and it's supporting loads from up above. And so rather than write all this information down, sometimes they do on drawings, they'll actually put uh, what the size is right on the plans, but it does take up a lot of space. Uh, this designer casting company, they always uh, go with uh, an abbreviation, and then you can just reference it L1, L2, L3. And then these ones here, 90 by 90 by six, six uh, on the wall, right? So this is referring to another lintel. This is a steel lintel, it's a steel angle iron. Uh, my masonry background, I used to be a bricklayer at one point. Uh, that's basically a three and a half by three and a half L-shaped piece of steel. And it, if you're looking, this is the metric, but this is what it, you know, typically you'll be getting three and a half inches by three and a half by a quarter inch thick. Uh, or it might be four or five inches by three and a half by five sixteenths. And that's to support the brick. So if you have a brick veneer, single wythe or single course of brick on the house, which is what we do typically uh, over the last 40, 50 years, if you have a brick veneer around, what goes over top of the opening, something has to support that. And it's not gonna be wood, it's gonna be steel. You don't barely see the steel angle iron. If you look up underneath a window, you usually see a little piece of steel. It might be painted and that's supporting the brick up above, only the brick uh, from that particular case because these houses here, they're wood frame construction. And so whether you have brick on the outside or not, the framing is what the structural part of the building is, right? And so uh, these, lower L1s to L6 are supporting the are for the lintel sizes over the opening and the wider the opening the wider the opening the heavier the material so you go from a 2 by 2 by 8 to a 2 by 10 to a 2 by 12 so the lintel uh, L1s the wider the opening the heavier the lintel is going to be like wider it's going to be because it's stronger that way and this is referring to how many pieces you have do you have two two by eights or do you have three two by eights um that's what that's referring to the number of they call it plies or the number of layers that are um, nailed together on that uh, particular lintel so those are a lot of little short short uh, cuts and we're talking about doors and uh, walls and window openings today so we also have a door schedule and the door schedule is referring to 
door sizes. So these are the sizes. They, they give you metric sizes here being Canada, but nobody orders anything metric uh, that way. You say, I want a two foot eight by six foot eight by inch and three quarters. This will be an exterior door when it's inch and three quarters. Most, most uh, interior doors are inch and three eighths where we are. They're prefabricated, they're hollow. Um, they're not very expensive. They can look like raised panel and they can be fairly um, nice looking, but uh, they're hollow core doors meant for the interior. You know, if it's a custom home, sometimes it is inch and three quarters uh, thick. It's more substantial and if it's solid wood and that sort of thing, less likely to warp and twist. Uh, so you can see the different numbers. And when we see a floor plan, well, that will tell us the door size. If you know the door size, then you can do the door opening. And the door opening size will be the door size plus the frame that goes around the door plus about three-eighths of an inch on each side. Unless it's exterior, then it's usually about a half an inch space. So you can shim it to adjust it so the door is perfectly plumb and perfectly level and it opens and closes really, really smoothly. So you need a little bit of extra space because when we frame walls and we frame floors, there's a certain amount of shrinkage and adjustment that takes place. So even if we did frame it perfectly, uh, it may warp or twist a little bit. We want to have some flexibility that we can shim those uh, windows and door frames perfectly so they close perfectly. Uh, from that perspective. So I'm just going to scroll down here a little bit just to give you, a, again, a quick overview of this, this house uh, that we're starting to take a look at. So you walk in the door, we see the living room there. Now you get the idea of the flat arch. So it's just a drop down from the ceiling at eight foot above finished floor. Hmm. A lot of ceilings are standard eight foot. So how is this flat arch, which is just basically like a drop down like you'd see over a doorway, uh, at eight foot. That's telling me that likely this has higher ceilings. How would I know what kind of ceiling height uh, this house is using? Well, I won't see it on the floor plan. That won't tell me that. That tells me everything horizontal. That will tell me things like uh, the, um, it'll tell me a bunch of different bits of information like where the center of this window opening is going to be, for example. It's going to be five foot five inches from the outside of the brick wall. Where is the inside of the frame wall going to be? It's going to be 11 inches from the outside of the brick wall. So that's giving me that information there. There's always some fine nuances you have to look at when you actually are doing the house though, because there could be some subtle differences. You know, bricks come at varying widths, all right? So you have to look at what's the width of the brick. We have to allow for an airspace between the brick and the wall. It doesn't really show you, well, like, it doesn't really show you that, but you can kind of see that little space there. There's always going to be an airspace because building code requires a one inch airspace between the brick and the structural wood frame wall. Uh, you're going to have a sheathing on the outside or you're going to have a rigid insulation on the outside of that wall or perhaps even both. You're going to have insulation in the wall. You're going to have drywall on the inside. So it's made up of a bunch of things. But this is telling you on this, it should be around 11 inches. But expect that things may vary slightly due to materials and placements on that. So sometimes there are these slight little differences that you have to get used to and adjust for appropriately. Um, this is showing from the outside of that wall to the center of this window is five foot five inches, right? So this is representing the center line of that window from the outside wall. And you see L1 and L7. So yeah, there's brick. That's the hatching for a brick. Those little angled lines, these little swirls are the hatching for insulation. And so we have five foot five. We would have to know, well, what is the window size for this particular wall? And that, for that, we would have to look at the elevations. And a second ago, I was thinking, what is the overall height of the uh, floor to ceiling? And so again, we might have to look uh, at the elevation drawings. You're not gonna find that information here. So that's where these drawings, they work together, right? And currently, we are looking at um, in this particular uh, drawing, elevation A, right? So main floor plan for elevation A. 
And it's talking, when it's talking about elevation, it's talking about the elevation drawing. What does it look like? So let's scroll down a few pages here and see if we can find elevation A. And so I'm going to just spin this around. Okay, so this is elevation A. I can see it says elevation A over there. And this is the front of that particular house. Now I can move this a little bit to the side here. And you can see here where you get the elevation heights. All right, so the heights uh, from top of the basement concrete floor slab. It's expected it's going to have a nice high basement in this particular case. It's got eight foot seven, but you got to remember this is to the finished main floor level. So this is including the thickness of the floor. So whatever the thickness of the floor that we would have to get from the actual floor plans. I think in this case, it's nine and a half if it's talking about uh, engineered floor trusses uh, or truss joists. And so you lose that space. You also lose the thickness of the subfloor. So when it says finished main level, that's one of the things that you have to think about. Finished main level. It's talking about the top of the subfloor. So these drawings, when they tell you that information, it's not talking about the top of the ceramic floor or the hardwood or the carpet. It's talking about the subfloor. And that's the plywood that goes on top of the floor joist that supports people walking on it and all of that other stuff. Uh, so that would be inclusive of the joist. Then it's got from finished main floor to finished second level. And this says nine foot 11. Again, that's inclusive of the floor joist, right? From here, it goes finished second level and it's got to top of plate. Well, that's going to be the actual wall height. So that's eight foot one. So that would give you kind of a standard eight foot ceiling inside once you basically put the drywall on and you put whatever, you know, if you're putting hardwood flooring or something like that, it's gonna put you very close into that zone of having an eight foot ceiling. They make it eight foot one, of course, you have drywall that goes across the top and then always the drywall goes on the ceiling first and then you put the drywall on the walls against that because that really supports the drywall really well around the edge. And drywall is four foot wide. So you got four foot and four foot. That would still give you a half an inch of space off the floor. You definitely don't want to have to have the drywallers cut a half an inch off the drywall all the time. So they design it so that it will actually fit really well. And you can even get pre-cut studs that will are cut to allow for a single bottom plate and a double top plate. And again, we talked about that in the previous video. Uh, you can go back, look at my uh, descriptions below and look at the playlist and you'll see in the previous video, we talked about framing terms so that you have a better idea of that. But we're at eight foot one. So that's basically for an eight foot ceiling. We're at nine foot 11. Now the floor, I think it will check it because we should verify it. I think it's around nine and a half inches. You're going to have your five eight subfloor. Uh, so again, or sorry, yeah, your five eight subfloor, nine and a half. So that's about ten and ten and an eighth. You're going to have your half inch drywall. So you're about ten and five eighths. So again, you're going to be in this particular case have a nine foot ceiling. So you're going to have nine foot ceiling more or less when you are done not less but probably slightly more so the drywall works because you can buy widened sheets um, that'll work out for nine foot ceilings uh, which makes it a little bit easier again for the drywaller to install depending on your jurisdictions um, these materials sometimes they're very sort of jurisdiction uh, specific very popular to have higher ceilings over the last 10 15 years prior to that we went through a long period where everybody just did eight foot ceilings. And prior to that, in older houses, really old houses, 10 foot ceilings, 12 foot ceilings, they're very popular, at least in some of the older parts of uh, Toronto. So we're kind of back to where, uh, at least on custom homes and even production, as these are production, uh, where you have options if you want a nine foot ceiling or a 10 foot ceiling. And so here is where you see the window sizes. So this is the front elevation for the house. This is the left side elevation here for the house uh, again. And this is for left side elevation A. So you got to be looking at what you're looking for. Is it on the right 
elevation. So this is the right side elevation, elevation A. And so this is showing us all the information for that right elevation. Again, just like you walk the floor plan inside the house, you should take a look at the house from all sides. And you know what? You can always freeze this and take a closer look at uh, these drawings on YouTube and take a good sort of uh, look and get a good sense of what's going on and orient yourself better. Now, I think on these particular drawings, because the rear elevation is more or less the same, just depending on, on the roof style, uh, they uh, don't change too much. But just to point out, see here, this is elevation B. So this is elevation B. See the front of the house, it's quite different. It's got like a gable roof over here. It's got like a soldier with a uh, roll-lock course above that, brick roll-lock. It's just the way that the brick are positioned. You can see which windows operate. These ones open, these ones are fixed glass here. You can see you got a semicircular arch here with a keystone. Uh, precast keystone brick so it gives kind of a, a really nice sort of look and you got this uh, flat roof over the porch so looks nice if I go back to elevation a if you recall let's go back there elevation a looks quite different it's the same floor plans little bit difference in the front of the floor plans where parts stick out but the rest of the house more or less the same except for the roof and the roof line. So if you're walking down the street and this house is right next to this house, you won't think it's exactly the same house when you walk in, but it's pretty close. There's a few minor things, but it's not much different as you can tell from the floor plans. Uh, so that's how builders are able to get different kind of looks going on the actual house. But let's go ahead I want to find the rear view because um, that's the left and right for B. And so just to pull up the side so you can see over here, ele rear elevation A and B. So it is more or less the same A and B. And you can sort of get an idea of the roof layouts too. So uh, the roof layouts here, this is roof plan A, right? A lot of different stuff going on at the front right so a lot of different stuff if i want to compare see you've got basically extra valley and hip here uh, a lot of different things going on here but look at the back the rear elevation more or less the same and so this back elevation here is more or less the same whether you've got elevation a front elevation a or front elevation b that part is going to remain pretty much the same and so this is where you would see, for example, the window size. So this is saying 24 wide. So they're individual units and usually the window manufacturer joins them up. So they make them up as individual units. This is a casement window that is hinged on this side that would basically open out. This would be a, basically a right hand uh, hinge on that and it would open outward. So the hinge is there. So this would swing that way outward. This one's fixed so it doesn't open, right? And it's got a brick soldier course over here. It's got a brick veneer all the way around. And this is the brick which is inside the house in that floor plan that we were just looking at uh, for uh, floor plan A. So let's go back there now. I think that's floor plan way back here going back 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 and I'm gonna have to spin this around again for you uh, I'll just do that right now there we are and so this is that right over the uh, sink so those size of windows what was it 24 by uh, I think it was uh, 48 Whatever those two are, so it's 24 and 24, you have to add them up. That would be 48 in width. And so let's just go back there, but we're talking about this right over the sink. You notice there's a patio door here. You also notice there's a window that is at each side of this fireplace. So you see how I got to look at the floor plan. I know where the center of the window is going. Then I have to go to the elevation drawings and take a good look at that so I can get a good sense of 
the rear of the house. So let's take a look up. This is the upgraded rear A. We were looking at just the regular um, rear elevation for A and B. So that's the one we were looking at. And it says 24 by 44, not 48. So that means we've got to frame this opening that it's big enough for 48 inches. Sorry, yeah, 48 inches in width and 44 inches in height. And we have to allow a space around it so we can shim it with cedar shims typically to adjust it so that it's exactly level, exactly plumb, nice and square so the windows operate properly and it looks nice from the inside. Your kitchen sink is right below this, right? So you have to get that elements fixed that way. Now, what height do we put the window? Well, that's where you look at the elevation drawing, top of window, top of door, right? So that's going to be the top of the window is going to be eight foot from the subfloor. So you know where you have to measure to, right? So from the main floor up to the top of the door window, that's going to be eight foot. And so that'll give you your line height. And so you notice that this is going across and this has a special eight foot patio door. So of course, when you do this, you want to make sure that they all line up. Uh, on the inside and also for the outside so the brick layers can do it all nice and even their brick will be nice and level and so that's important as well that's why it's important when you start the footings and you do the foundation wall everything is level and then you do your floor it's level and then it makes it easy when you frame everything to have that level as well uh, all you're doing is then measuring from a, the floor the subfloor to the top of the window if I know where the top of the window is, guess what? I know where the bottom of it's going to be because then I just got to measure down 44. Now, I'm not going to only measure 44. I got to allow for that space around the window. Usually on exterior windows and door frames, we allow a half an inch around the edge. Some of you might say, well, in my jurisdiction, we allow three eighths on each edge. That's fine. As long as you're in that zone and you can adjust it and shim it to plumb. But also it's important to remember that you got to put foam insulation around that gap and make sure it's really sealed well. Uh, so usually half an inch works pretty good. It gives you a lot of flexibility. You got room to put the foam, uh, foam insulation in and make it really, really tightly sealed from that way. The other thing is I would never go only from the drawings. Now I want you to repeat after me. The map is not the territory. The map is not the territory. It just means drawings are not perfect. I wish I could say they were, and I, it's not fair to any designer to expect that. There's always these new, you know, you might be using a window manufacturer's catalog and all of a sudden they change something. I would want to make sure that what I ordered, what is the actual outside size of these windows? So I've ordered whatever the manufacturer is. And again, you can look at the construction notes or you can look at notes and specifications that would tell you uh, this is a Palo window, this is a Marvin window, this is whatever uh, window. From that particular manufacturer, I would want to make sure, okay, so the outside size of these windows, are they 48? This unit that's coming together, is it 48 by 44? Yes, it is. All right, then it's easy. Then I just add an inch to the width. So now I've got 49. And then I add an inch to the height. Now I've got 45. And then I shim it so I've got a half inch space all around it. And then I foam it. And as long as I put it in level, square, plumb, then it is going to operate and provide many years of service. Last thing you ever want to do when you're framing houses is to frame the openings too small and then have to make them wider. You'd be much better to make it slightly too big than to make it too small. Um, so that's another thing that you learn once you do that wrong, like I've done over the years. Uh, long time since I've done that wrong, but uh, you just have to do that once and you learn your lesson, right? And it's not a big check. This does not take a lot of time to check and it's so worthwhile. In production building, they usually have the site super and they're going around and they're making sure that the framers know the exact rough opening because they don't want that problem either. Uh, it just makes things go very smooth. And you're always trying to, when you're reading drawings, think ahead. Think ahead. And so these are window openings. These are door openings. You want to make sure that they're going to work 
very, very well. And so I can get my heights for information over here. It's where I can get that. And I've got to understand where it's measuring from and where it's measuring to. And oh, that was the other thing I mentioned. So we want to see, well, what is the floor joist size? So this is another one. So I'm just going to go back here for a second here and we'll go to the basement floor plan. I'll just turn this around for you. So there you go, nine and a half engineered floor joists. Well, with engineered floor joists, I'd want to make sure they are actually nine and a half inches. Again, it depends who's the manufacturer. There's a lot of engineered floor joist manufacturers. Uh, there's more differences uh, than not between them. So you got to make sure that what is that actual height, especially if you're trying to figure out different overall heights and what things are going to be at. So it's good to know that. And uh, we also see on this drawing here uh, a hexagon symbol, how this designer has done it. They do it very well organized. I love the way that they uh, organize things on their drawing. It's so consistent. Uh, it's great. Uh, so they use the hexagon here, symbol. It's frequently used, but not always used. And so that's number seven. Okay, that's easy peasy. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to go to my construction notes and I'm going to look at seven. All right, so in this case, it's talking about the concrete slab because I'm in the basement, right? So it's talking about the slab uh, and it's giving me information about that. Then here it says number eight, finished floor on, so 15.9 five eighths tongue and groove subfloor very popular the other one that's very popular is three quarter inch uh subfloor nice as if it is actually three quarter inch uh plywood tongue and groove a lot of times it's osb um, which is oriented strand board it looks like a bunch of wafers that are glued together either way that's what it's uh referring to so now i know the thickness of the subfloor as well so finding that information is not that difficult uh, when you are reviewing different information for different things. You can actually see if I go here, it, sh it should show. Let's get to the first floor. See number eight. So it's giving you information about the subfloor uh, that's uh, being used on this particular uh, project. And when it's showing you the floor joists, this is showing you for the floor above. So this is showing for the second floor. So I'm looking at the first floor. Uh, floor plan that shows me the second floor joist. I look at the foundation that shows me the first floor joist, right? So you sort of get it from that perspective. It's always looking at the floor above you. But as you also saw when it shows in the basement number seven, that's giving you information with regards to the basement slab uh, as opposed to uh, the actual, um, the actual uh, thickness of the subfloor. So we've been looking at this drawing for a little bit. We see that you'd walk in. Oh, here on this particular drawing, it says optional coffered ceiling. So coffered, a true coffered ceiling is like beams and they crisscross each other. A traditional coffered ceiling looks like that looks, looks outstanding uh, that way. In this case, they've, they've called this bulkhead that's surrounding the room a coffered ceiling. Again, this can look outstanding too. You put some pot lights uh, in the right spots and you have some paintings and different things on the wall. It can really make it pop. The other nice thing about this too, you can use it as a source to collaborate with your uh, plumbing subcontractor and your HVAC subcontractor if you have some ducts that you need to reallocate so that you can avoid having unsightly bulkheads, a uh, bulkhead that just kind of goes half a wall and stops, it looks awful. Um, so if it's part of a plan, that can be very nice in there too. Uh, but they've definitely angled this off to make it really kind of a feature of the dining room and to make it stand out. Uh, again, you've got that above finished floor, the flat arch, so that's kind of a, a bit of a thing in this design that's going on uh, around the house. Uh, so we're walking through. By the way, we walked in the front door. To the left, PR stands for powder room, which is usually a two-piece, uh, a uh, water closet or toilet, and in this case, a uh, basin. Uh, we usually call a sink that is in a washroom a basin. Uh, plumber always was correcting me on this when I was a kid, so I kind of it kind of stuck um, there. But it looks like a pedestal sink, but it, you know that basin that we have in the in the uh, powder room and so then you walk through the dining room here you see steps it says up 16 risers well that's the other thing you got to remember too 
if you have higher ceilings, guess what? You have more risers. If you have more risers, it takes up more space, the stairs, because there's more run to it. You've got rise and run, and we'll call it, cover that off in another episode. Uh, you walk through here. Again, you got an opening going through here. You got an opening going through here. You got a nice breakfast area. You got a little desk area over here. The ceiling is sloping a little bit here. Um, and it's uh, or it's uh, lowered a little bit here. You've got basically it lowered here a pantry uh, kind of uh, I guess to store your extra corn and vegetables and different things that canned stuff that you might have. Uh, nice kitchen area with an island and a breakfast nook area here wide open patio door and the great room and the great room opens and we've got a direct vent fireplace which means it'll be a natural gas fireplace and it will vent directly out through the wall so you don't have to have a chimney going up the whole house and if you remember the rear elevation we looked at uh, then we could uh, we would see that so there's a bunch of information there with regards to it and we can also see there's some hexagon symbols that we could check out and look this is, looks like it's a step so that in case there's a change in grade, whether you'd have a single step or whether you might have to have a little bit of a walkout deck with steps will be dependent on the site plan. And we talked about site plans in one of the earlier videos too. You can go back to and what the elevation of the property is. Does it slope off? Does it slope back? Is it fairly flat? That will change based on individual properties on a subdivision like this particular uh, set of drawings. So you kind of walk through there and you can see here too, there's a, what they call a sunken mud room. And usually that's very common. So it says down one riser. So it's going down. And so again, the elevations and the door heights will change because you want to be able to walk out to the garage much more fluidly and that makes it easier because you don't want to end up with a bunch of steps in the garage because then in that case, you won't be able to park the cars because they're taking up too much space. So we've got that going on. Why don't we take a look at the second floor and what that actually looks at. So you notice it said up 16 risers before. Well, now it says down 12 risers and down four risers. So this technology area here is lower uh, than these areas, right? So this master bedroom area here is at a higher elevation four risers, all right, then the technology center. And then this area here, you got to go up four risers or down four from that area. So it, this whole area here is all at the same elevation, but this is at a little bit lower elevation here. Um, so it's dropped down a little bit as a result of that. And if you actually go back and you go to this uh, floor plan, you see that there's a bunch of things going here. Drop ceiling, right? Well, this dropped down, but the ceiling also drops down a little bit correspondingly. And that's why this here is showing that X because this whole area here is dropped down a little bit because of that technology area. So that usually takes a little bit of time for you to study and to take a look at and to come to grips with exactly how will that particular area um, be framed out when you get um, to detailing that part of it, right? And part of that drop down area is somewhat impacted uh, by here. So this would also tend to be dropped down as a result of, because you can see the stairs is going up here, but you got a little bit of space up above that is in this area, which is also lower. So that's going actually into the garage area, that little bit of lower part of ceiling. So you have to review the drawings for a period of time and get used to them. It would be what I would suggest. And of course, if you're going to be framing it, you got to really look at those kind of details um, very, very closely to figure out exactly what's being framed where and which beams are going to be at different heights and for what reason now it can be helpful if there is a section that cuts through so because usually what the designer will do is they'll try to give you a section detail if it is something that's a little bit complex so that you can get a better sense of what's going on so you notice the cutting plane lines we talked about these so there's going to be a cut through right through that stairs right through where you have that difference in height so you'll get a better idea of what i'm talking about 
Um, this section detail right here, bookshelf niche detail, this is talking about right over, uh, let's see, right over here it says halfway optional 40 book, bookshelf niche, see detail. So in that case, that's looking at this right there. All right, so sometimes you might see a detail that's on the same page. Others, you might have to go hunting for it a little bit. In these residential drawings, it's not that many pages, so it's fairly straightforward. When you get into a set of commercial drawings or you know, for a condominium building or something of that nature, you might have 70, 80, 100 pages of drawings. They should then at that point reference what page this would be on. In this case, it's not really that difficult. So we'll just go to section AA right now. Okay, so I'm at section AA right now. As I said, now it gets you a good sense of different elevations here, right? So I can see this is up going up into um, the master bedroom. I don't see the one that's going up to the other bedrooms because it's cut in front of those, but I do see this technology center, how it is framed lower, how this stairs goes up here and you go one, two, three, four risers up. And usually the designer, if they've drawn it well, they will have done the risers accurately too. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I knew it. They always do it really good here. But don't count it for every designer, but just um, if you get some really good designers, they make sure they're into the details, right? And so you can see the stairs up. You can see this is lower than the other bedroom. So there's bedroom number four. So there's where that finished second floor level is at. So the technology center has a uh, from the subfloor on the technology center to the top plate, 10 foot four inches, right? But on the finished second level overall, it's eight foot one. So that's where you're seeing the difference in heights for your wall heights. And that's giving you a lot of good, valuable information there. So you can picture it much better. And that's a, basically a really good uh, cutting plane a section detail, section AA. That's why it said section AA, that you can see that information there for that purpose, right? Remember it, on that same page, it also said section of shed roof. This is that little section that's going out there so it's giving you a close-up of that and that's section x and no nts if you remember not to scale uh, it's just reminding you not to scale these for exact uh, measurements um, from that perspective okay so uh, you're getting a good sense of your way around let's just zoom back okay so we're back and Again, just I would pretend I'm walking around the second floor. We walked around the first floor. Let's walk around the second floor. So this is this technology center. Really, that's kind of like where the kids would probably do homework, that sort of thing, I would guess. With home offices these days, that could be a nice home, open home office area as well. Uh, that would be helpful. And then this is closed off. This is the whole sort of, I guess, parents area, master bedroom area optional fireplace when you see something like that with the dashed lines it's not a hidden line in that case it's just saying if you want to pay the extra amount of money we'll put in an optional direct vent fireplace you can have in the master um, bedroom and it's got information about the roof system which we'll get into in another particular class now here it's here they put 36 inch door but usually they've always put just the number and then you would reference the construction notes and if I see the number, then I know what size of door this is. And then I know what size to make the rough opening. Again, inside you're going to make the rough opening. Well, let's see, this says number three. So let's go look at number three here. And we see number three. It says two foot six by six foot eight by inch and three eighths. Pretty standard stuff. So you would frame this door, the thickness of the frame on each side. So that's three quarters of an inch, three quarters of an inch. Maybe it's five eighths, five eighths. They keep making this stuff cheaper and cheaper. Uh, and so that would be an inch and a half for the frame. And then you'd want to allow three eighths to half an inch on each side. I usually on an interior door only allow three eighths because I don't have to put insulation around. And that's giving me three quarters overall. And that's enough to shim it because I don't like to use more shims than I have to. Uh, so usually that usually what I 
add to a, an opening is usually about two and a quarter inches if it's those measurements, right? If it's five eighths and five eighths, you might only need to add two inches to it. Uh, so it depends on the on the actual frame size. So somewhere between two and two and a quarter inches. So that would give you around two foot eight to two foot eight and a quarter as your rough opening size. And then you got to look at the height and the height you can be off by a little bit more. You know, it's better to have a little bit more than not enough. Uh, in that case, so you got to allow for the frame over the top. You also got to allow, is there hardwood going on the floor? Is it three quarters of an inch? Because that's going to raise the floor. And then you got to think, do I want to have a bit of a space underneath the door? Sometimes that lets uh, the cold air returns work much better in the rooms. If you ever find there's a room and it's freezing cold and you've shut the door at night and there's carpet, it's probably sealing up that room pretty good if you don't have a cold air return in that particular room. Now, if you cut a little bit off the door that the air can flow through better, it won't become pressurized and it'll be get a lot more warm air to it. So generally you wanna have a bit of a space underneath the door. What that is, you could debate it, but usually you want at least around three quarters of an inch underneath the door. Uh, three quarters to one inch but some cases you know you want it fairly tight maybe a washroom for a variety of reasons um, that's kind of a personal preference but for sure you don't want to have the uh, finished carpenter having to cut all the doors that's a lot of unnecessary work when we think about lean construction we think about eliminating and uh, reducing waste and that would be big time waste uh, that would be frustrating for whoever had to do it because they're thinking in their head if they had just thought a little bit it would have not been a problem so we've looked at walking through the house the concept of visualizing what you're looking at we've talked about a lot of points on uh, framing members and window locations and rough opening sizes for windows and doors orienting yourself uh, where uh, stair where framing members are indicated on the drawings this here is sb that stands for solid bearing that means there's something being supported from above uh, and that's driving that weight from above down through. So it's being supported. Usually it's got things like uh, beams or girder trusses from a, a roof truss that is creating this load. And you want that weight because the roof trusses, if it's a girder truss that's supporting other trusses, that concentrated load to flow through the walls down into the foundation walls, down through the foundation walls, onto the footing, down to undisturbed soil, and the house is stable um, so that you don't get sagging or potential uh, structural issues. So whenever you see SB, it's talking about solid uh, bearing, making sure that that's solidly supported. If it's two by six walls, that those walls are solidly supported with two by sixes uh, right directly underneath, not only on this floor, but all the way through, all the way down to the foundation wall um, from there. So that's another indicator line that you will see on that. These doors here, so as I was saying, you know, you go, you find the door number four, and that would tell you the door size and how you make it. It's also how it's swung. That means the hinges are here. And this particular door is what we call a left-hand door. It means it opens to the left. If you stand in the doorway, and we used to always say, you know, there's these butt hinges, right? That's what they're called, butt hinges. Regular hinges you see on a door, they're called butt hinges. If you stand with your butt to the butt, looking this way, then essentially my left hand would be here, so that would be a left-hand door. If it opened this way, it would be a right-hand door. Let's take a look at that. What swing does this door have? Is it a left or a right? Got it? It's a left-hand door. What about this door? It's a right-hand door. So that's how, you know, you're standing with your butt to the butt. This would be my right arm on this side. This would be my left arm on this side. And that's how the door opens. A lot of doors we order today, especially in production anyways, are pre-hung, saves time. And so you have to order them, do I want left-hand or do I want right-hand? And so you have to know those kind of things as well. This is? right hand door all right so that's what i wanted to cover in this video i'll be diving more deeply as we go through this series into other parts and components so hopefully this is helping you to learn more about reading construction 
drawings and just remember the map is not the territory know there's some differences and nuances that you have to review and understand and onward and upward we'll see you next time please uh, click subscribe if you enjoyed this video leave comments questions and we'll see you in the next series bye for now